Hey there, thanks for tuning in to Duck Bricks, and welcome to Chapter 3 of Bionicle Retold, the show where I recap and analyze the entire Bionicle storyline from beginning to the end. So far we've covered a prologue and chapters 1 and 2 which mostly were just setting up expository information about the world and getting you a sense of exactly what's been going on throughout the universe. This chapter is the first time where again we are covering a new year of the Bionicle storyline. So it's actually the first time where we'll actually be going through some of the major story content for an entire year's worth of story for the LEGO theme. This year we're covering is the year of 2004 and 2005. Specifically, these were prequel years that were created after Bionicle was first launched in 2001, but since we're going chronologically, these are our first years of actual LEGO-themed storyline. As usual, just a quick spoiler warning, I will be spoiling all of the events of the universe. If you're this far, you probably already have been spoiled with some of the biggest reveals, but just in case this is your first time watching these videos, I am going through and spoiling all of the major reveals to explain everything in chronological order. As such, some of the major mysteries that drove the theme and actually made it so successful and intriguing have already been spoiled basically in the prologue. So definitely, if you want to experience the story fresh, I urge you to check out my video linked in the description below in terms of how to get started with the Bionicle storyline if you want to go in completely fresh and not actually have anything spoiled to you from the beginning. But so without further ado, let's just dive right into this chapter, starting off with a recap of last week's episode. Chapter 2, Rise of the Brotherhood. Previously on Bionicle Retold. Corruption. Deep inside the heart of the Matoran universe, the Brotherhood of Makuta, once the protectors of peace and justice, have secretly turned dark. Plotting to overthrow the great spirit Mata Nui and led by the ambitious Makuta Teradax, the Brotherhood's tendrils spread across the universe, stoking the flame of conflict between Metru Nui, the brain of the robot, and the Dark Hunters, ruthless bounty hunters with their eyes set on this city of legends. While noble Toa once protected the city and the universe from harm, many have met their fates in mysterious accidents, out on mission for the wise elder Turaga Duma, who is secretly Teradax in disguise. Now the fate of Metru Nui and the world falls into the hands of one battle-weary warrior, Toa Likon, as he urgently seeks to transfer his power into six new worthy Matoran, creating the next generation of heroes. This is Bionicle Retold. Chapter 3, Legends of Metru Nui Part 1, Fist of the Vaki Under the leadership of the false Turaga Duma, Metru Nui slowly fell from a beacon of light and order to a dark Orwellian police state. Matoran were forced to work longer and longer hours with those who refused meeting grisly fates. With oversight from the false Duma, the Vaki police force were retrofitted with staffs of suggestion tools that could bend the mind of even the most strong-willed Matoran and force them back to work. Vaki Nurak used staffs of command to fill their target's mind with a single overriding command that was obeyed until the effect wore off. Vaki Bordak used staffs of loyalty to fill the target with a strong desire for Duma's sense of order, causing them to betray even their closest friends for minor infractions. Zadok used staffs of suggestion, turning the Matoran against each other and using them to convince troublesome comrades to return to work. Vaki Kirak used staffs of confusion, scrambling their target's sense of time and place to prevent troublemaking. Rorzak used staffs of presence, allowing them to see and hear what their target saw or heard without their knowledge. These powerful staffs also allowed the Rorzak to detect any rebellious thoughts Matoran may hold, quashing them before they ever got to act on their thoughts. And worse of all, the Vaki Vorzak used staffs of erasing temporarily eliminating their target's higher mental functions, leaving intact only motor skills. The targets of all these staffs were called Shamblers, Matoran wandering aimlessly through the streets of the Metrus. With the Vaki police force, the false Duma kept a firm grip over the city of Metru Nui, punishing any infractions incredibly harshly and modifying the Vaki's AI processing units to use extreme force and brutality whenever possible. 
While the staffs never physically harm Matoran permanently as to not decrease productivity, the mental ramifications of the Vaki's abilities cause the Matoran workforce to live in constant, perpetual fear, forever watched by the Vaki that lurked above. Even beyond this powerful police force, new threats lurked in the outskirts of Metro Nui. Makuta Teradax, operating incognito throughout the city as Duma, unleashed a vile, intelligent plant known as the Morbuzak on the edges of the city. Stretching its vines deep within Matoran civilization, the Morbuzak was designed to push the Matoran into the center of the city, making them centralized in one place. Don't worry if you're confused. You're gonna find out exactly why Teradax wanted all of the Matoran of Metro Nui in one centralized location later on in this chapter, so don't worry about that and sit tight for now. The Morbizok's first known action was to grow vines in the area of the Great Furnace and drive the Matoran away, allowing it to grow its king root in the center of the massive building, fueled by molten protodermis and the flames. From there it spread its vines all throughout the city, attacking structures and Matorans seemingly at random, although of course mostly keeping to the edges of the various Metru. The Matoran and even some Vaki fought back, but it was clear that the Morbuzak was too strong for them to defeat. This extreme rising threat of the Morbuzak, coupled with Duma's push to a dystopian police state, caused Toa Likan, sole protector of Metru Nui, to grow deeply suspicious of its leadership and form his own plans. Part 2. Faithful Matoran to Mighty Toa After many long years guarding the mighty city of Metru Nui alone, Toa Likan secretly stole six Toa stones from the Great Temple in Ga Metru, transformative objects with the power to grant a Matoran incredible strength, fighting prowess and elemental abilities, becoming a Toa themselves. Just as he readied to leave, a massive blast rocked the temple, and Li Khan found himself face to face with his former comrade turned traitor, the Dark Hunter Nidiki, and Kreka, the brutish and hulking Dark Hunter assigned to keep Nidiki in line. Escaping after a short skirmish, Li Khan hurried himself to grant the six stones to six Matoran he deemed worthy of becoming Toa. And yet, in an ironic twist of fate, Makuta Teradax himself used his mental abilities to influence Lee Khan's decision, twisting his mind to pick six Matoran who were quarrelsome, discordant, and overall not fit to be Toa. But little did Teradax know, but the Order of Mata Nui, who had been secretly watching all these events unfold, had personally tricked Teradax into influencing Lee Khan to pick the correct set of heroes whose flaws would later take them on an emotional journey to grow into the true guardians of the city. In the Ga Metru School District, Li Khan delivered the first stone to Nokama, a teacher who was wise beyond her years. Moving to Po Metru, the second stone went to Onua, a stubborn carver and craftsman in the quarries. Next was Ko Metru, where a scholar named Nuju received the third stone. In turn, an archivist named Wanua from Onu Metru was granted the fourth, and a test driver named Matau from Li Metru was given the fifth. Finally, Li Khan descended on his home region, Ta Metru, bearing the final stone to a Ta Matoran forger named Vakama. When Li Khan discovered Vakama, he was deep in the midst of crafting a mask, using the most powerful discs available to him to forge the legendary Mask of Time. Just a quick recap of the events of the prologue in Chapter 1 Beginnings, the great beings who are the people responsible for creating this entire Matoran universe actually drafted up plans to make three legendary Kanohi. The Kanohi Ignika, or the Mask of Life, was the failsafe placed within Mount Valmai to restart the heart of the great spirit Mata Nui. The Mask of Creation was given to Artaka, which allowed him to create literally anything. The Kanohi Vahi, which was the Mask of Time, was originally created to allow users to slow or speed up time in certain areas of the robot, but unfortunately, due to the events of the Shattering, the Great Beings never actually got to make this mask, instead being forced to abandon their plans as the robot left the planet of Spheres Magna. What's really significant about this is that certain members of the Matoran universe, namely Vakama, actually have the ability to create a legendary Kanohi such as the Vahi, which means that their minds are about as sophisticated as some of the great beings were, which definitely goes to show just how far the sentience Velika gave them has gone. In Ta Metru, Li Khan snuck into the forge, granting Vakama with the final Toa stone and leaving him with cryptic messages to rescue the city from the grip of the Morbuzak and something far darker. With all stones delivered and instructions given to the Matoran to go to the Great Temple, Likon's final task was done. 
But before he got a chance to leave, Likon's revelation to Vakama was interrupted when Nidiki sprung from the shadows of the forge along with Kreka. After a short fight, Nidiki dangled the helpless Vakama over the burning furnace, forcing Likon to throw down his weapons and surrender himself, or else watch Vakama burn. As Likon was bound by the Dark Hunters and Vakama barely escaped alive, the grip of the Morbuzak tightened around Tometru, forcing a widespread evacuation to the center of the city. With its sole protector in chains and a false leader commanding the Matoran, these were dark times for Metru Nui. And so, in the temple in Ga Metru, these six Matoran gathered to fulfill their destiny. They were stubborn, harboring ill will towards each other with the remnants of long past Matoran civil war still influencing their bias. Struggling to keep the peace among the newly assembled group, Nokama attempted to reconcile the Matoran as their Toa Stones began to glow, activated by their presence in the temple. Six tendrils of energy burst from the raised Suva, striking the bodies of the Matoran and imbuing them with Toa energy. And so, they were transformed, and that day signaled the solemn end of their Matoran lives. No longer were they humble craftsmen, now they were powerful warriors, new protectors of the city. Vakama, Toa of Fire, Nokama, Toa of Water, Matau, Toa of Air, Nuju, Toa of Ice, Oniwa, Toa of Stone, and Wenua, Toa of Earth. Together, they would become the Toa Metru, icons of peace and justice across the city. But they were far from a cohesive team yet, and a series of trials and tribulations awaited them. Part 3. The Great Search as the Toa observed their new forms in awe, Vakama was struck with a vision of the Great Discs, six of the most powerful Kanoka Discs in existence. While standard Kanoka Discs were plentiful and could be used to form many masks around the city, the six Great Discs were something special, created by Artaka himself with the intent to be fused together into a Disc of Time. Each Great Disc represented one of the six elemental metros across the vast city. Beyond this, the discs were the only objects with the power to eliminate the King Root of the Morbuzak, destroying its grip on the city. And so, the Toa set out on a grand quest to seek out and uncover the hidden locations of the discs. Partnering with Matoran who had been entrusted with the locations of the discs, the Toa took on this new task with varying levels of enthusiasm, only one in particular doubting Vakama's visions and belittling what he saw as a mere scavenger hunt. Just a quick note here, I am kind of blasting through one of these first major initial arcs for the Toa Mechu, mostly because it's not too, too relevant for the main story as a whole. Kind of unfortunate I have to do this, but we do have to cut this down into a format that is easily digestible. That being said, if you are interested in this setting or in these characters, I actually would highly recommend that you go and check out the Search for the Matoran and the Search for the Masks, which were comic and book arcs, which covered the story that I've summarized in very, very quick format here, which especially details the Toa Mechu learning how to use their elemental abilities, trying to work together as a team, and really gives a lot of characterization to each member, some of which I'll barely even mention throughout this recap. So if you are interested in these characters and want to learn more about their personalities, definitely go check out those books and comics because they do do a great job of setting up these people as a Toa team, just not necessarily major world-breaking stuff that we'll have to officially discuss in these recap videos. As the Toa sought out the discs and grew into their new forms, they were deceived by the treacherous Pomatoran Akmau, who had been paid off by Nadiki to ensnare the other Matoran who knew the locations of the discs and confuse the Toa into wasting their time and running into traps. I'm mentioning Akmau now because this is not the last we'll see of this slippery character in many more stories to come. Just remember, Akmau is kind of a devious guy. Blaming each other for this deception, the Toa were forced to fight to overcome their differences, banding together to use the disc to eventually destroy the Morbuzak in a climactic battle, resulting in the utter annihilation of the vines and the vicious plant's grip on the city to diminish. Triumphant in their first great quest, the Toa Metru turned to the Colosseum, where they would show that they were indeed heroes of Metru Nui. But before being able to claim their victory and present the great disc to Turaga Duma, the Toa Metru were sidetracked in Onu Metru by a crowd of panicking Onu Matoran, urging them to descend into the depths of the archives and help seal an underwater leak that threatened to flood the entire district. In the darkness of the archives, the Toa struggled to act as a cohesive team, constantly bickering and interrupting each other's elemental attacks. 
Little did they know, but they were being stalked by a highly intelligent, shape-shifting Rahi known as Kraka, who was angered by their intrusion into her territory, but also deeply curious about the nature of the Toa. Observing their discordance, Kraka used their conflict to her advantage to confuse the Toa and further her agenda. Sowing seeds of distrust and conflict in the group, the Toa Metru came close to killing each other before Nuju stepped in to calm the team, uncovering the crafty shapeshifter's plots. In a climactic battle with the Kraka, Nokama managed to trick her into assuming a combination of the bodies of all six Toa Metru, overwhelming the telepathic shapeshifting Rahi with information and allowing the Toa Metru to escape. With the battle behind them and the cracks in the archive sealed, the Toa returned to the surface of the city with an important lesson in trust learned. Part 4. Trials of the Toa Metru In the Grand Colosseum of Metru Nui, the Toa Metru finally made their first public appearance to the assembled crowd. Presenting the Great Disc to Turaga Duma, the Toa Metru prepared to be officially sworn in as the protectors of Metru Nui, but little did they know that Duma, secretly Teradax in disguise, would make it much, much harder for them. Belittling their quest for the discs and decrying them as useless, Duma ordered the Toa to pass a great test to prove they were not imposters and deserved to be the guardians of the city. Yet again, the Toa failed to show unity, tackling the task individually and refusing to work together. And so, as Duma ordered the Vaki to swarm the Toa, three of their rank were captured, Nuju, Wanua, and Onua, while only Vakama, Matau, and Nokama managed to escape. With the remaining Toa Metru framed for Likon's disappearance and the Vaki on high alert, Teradax prepared to enact his final plans, still in the guise of Duma. And so, after many confrontations with the Vaki and the Dark Hunter pair of Nidiki and Kreka, the three remaining Toa Metru slowly and painfully began to learn to work as a team, as they unlocked their mass powers one by one. Nokama using her Mask of Translation to commune with a rampaging Rahi Horde, and Matau using the Mask of Shapeshifting to fool Nidiki and Kreka, using similar tactics the shapeshifting Rahi Kraka used on him to sow discord between the Dark Hunters. All this time, Vakama continued to be beset by twisted visions of the future, foreseeing a vast web covering Metru Nui, his own face contorted into a monster, and a failure to save his team and the city. Throughout these adventures, the three Toa encountered yet another monstrous, intelligent Rahi known as the Tatarak, who emerged from a crevice in the ground demanding an answer to a mysterious question. After temporarily incapacitating the mysterious speaking Rahi, the battle-weary trio sought refuge on a Vaki transport in Po Metru, still seeking to find the missing Likon and free their missing comrades. In the meantime, Nuju, Onua, and Wenua strove constantly to free themselves from their cell, but continued to fail yet again due to their non-stop bickering, with some even giving up, accepting their fate. It was then that a mysterious figure emerged from the depths of the prison, a Turaga, who simply told them that they could easily get out, if only they activated their unique mask powers and worked together as a team. Under the instruction of this strange figure, the three Toa began a journey of self-discovery of their own. Meanwhile, in the scuttling Vaki transport, Vakama, Nokama, and Matau discovered a multitude of eerie spherical storage containers. Upon placing his hand on the surface of a container, Vakama was struck with another vision of a Matoran sealed within, her eyes gleaming a crimson hue. Awakening from his reverie traumatized, Vakama opened the containers, revealing only emptiness within. Before they could investigate further, they were beset by the Dark Hunters, skirmishing with them across the fields of Po Metru before narrowly escaping with their lives. At this time, in the prison of the Dark Hunters, Wanua and Onua ceased their work and argued amongst each other, frustrated with the trivial task given to them by their Turaga. It was then that Onua's mask power inadvertently activated, commanding his comrade to take a seat and discovering his mask of mind control. Simultaneously, Nuju discovered the powers of his Mask of Telekinesis, using his mental force to tear down a prison wall and allowing the three Toa to escape alongside the mysterious Elder. With Wenua using his Mask of Night Vision to see through the caverns of Po Metru and find a route out, it wasn't long until the Toa Metru were finally reunited at last, sharing tales of their exploits. The Elder then revealed himself to be Likon, his power drained and fully transformed into a Turaga after he had transformed the six Matoran into Toa Metru. While Vakama believed they had completed their mission and saved what he believed to be the heart of Metru Nui, Likon was disappointed in the Toa. 
In all their bickering, conflicts, and side quests, they had failed to address the root of the problem and uncover Teradax's true plan, which involved the endangered Matoran. All his attempts to weaken the city, from the brutal Vaki to the vines of the Morguzak, and even to the capture and detainment of the Toa, had resulted in a populace ready and willing for subjugation and control. And so, deep in the catacombs of Po Metru, the Toa finally uncovered the truth. Turaga Duma was an imposter, and the real Duma's body was kept in suspended animation in one of the mysterious metal spheres. Part 5. The Great Cataclysm Rushing to confront the false Duma, the six Toa Metru alongside Turaga Likon sped towards the Grand Colosseum. But they were too late. The robotic Vaki had rounded up all the Matoran, placing them in hibernation within the many spherical pods they discovered earlier. Upon confronting the false Duma, they learned he was Teradax in disguise, and his plan to take over the Great Spirit was well underway. As a note, Teradax specifically placed the Matoran into these spherical pods, which would induce amnesia and make them forget everything about their lives in Metru Nui, so that when Teradax eventually woke up these Matoran, they would only know him as their ruler. As another side note, these are actually the lids to the canisters that the Toa Metru came in, which is some more pretty fun toy set integration even where the packaging is concerned. And yes, you can fit a full Matoran inside this sphere. Teradax's virus to render, the great spirit Matanui Komatos had taken grip over the Matoran universe, causing the now slumbering great spirit robot to plummet from its orbit. In a cruel twist of fate, the robot was ready to return to the star system that started it all, the remains of Spherus Magna now split into the three celestial bodies. But as it orbited around Aqua Magna and broke its orbit, the great spirit robot plummeted, crashing into the waves of the ocean planet. Massive earthquakes struck the entire Matoran universe, with widespread devastation wreaking havoc on the internal mechanisms. In the destruction, Teradax began to siphon and consume Metru Nui's power source for himself, prepping to take Mata Nui's place as the prime intelligence in command of the robot universe. The events of this great cataclysm were widespread, resulting in several major and climactic events to simultaneously occur across the universe. Some of the events I'm about to describe relating to the Great Cataclysm aren't too too relevant for the story as a whole, just keep them in mind because I'm saying them now because they chronologically take place at this time, and don't worry, well, I will mention Great Cataclysm in the future when they become relevant again, I'm just telling you them now because it happens in chronological order. The most important of these is probably what happened to the Baraki, which we're about to get to. If you recall from last chapter, Rise of the Brotherhood, the Baraki were the six warlords who were basically perfect physical specimens, who once ruled over the League of Six Kingdoms which united the lands of the Matoran universe, although eventually they were captured and sent to the massive jail which was the Pit. As the robots struck Aqua Magna and shockwaves cascaded over the world, the great prison of the Pit was smashed open, with the prisoners being engulfed in the black waters of Aqua Magna. As radiation leaked from the damaged robot and mixed with the foreign waters of the ocean, a mutagenic substance affected the prisoners, twisting their physical forms and transforming them into full-on water breathers. Most notably, the once proud Baraki warlords were mutated into grotesque, animalistic monsters, cursed to lurk the depths of the ocean. As the Baraki escaped, they murdered Hydraxon, who was the warden of the prison and member of the Order of Matanui who trained the Toa Mata himself. Elsewhere in the universe, the southern continent, which housed the pivotal Mount Valmai and sacred Mask of Life, split apart, with a section of the continent breaking away from the mainland and skyrocketing upwards, bursting forth onto the external shell and finally settling as a floating island outside of the main robot, on the surface of Aqua Magna's ocean. The villagers who survived the harrowing events came to call this island Voya Nui, for great voyage in the Matoran language. Sadly, Turaga Jovan, the former Toa of Magnetism and member of the team who saved the Great Spirit, perished in this ascent. On this island, two agents of the Order of Mata Nui were stationed. Brutaka, who was deeply shaken by the event and believed the Great Spirit had either perished or abandoned the universe, and his companion Axon, who stood firm in his faith for the Great Spirit to one day return. Despite their disagreements, both warriors stood guard in secret over the Mask of Life, continuing to fulfill their duties. 
In Karda Nui, the heart of the universe, the mutagenic, irradiated water spilled into the dome, filling the base of the heart of the robot with a great swamp coalescing on the ground of Karda Nui. Stalactites on the ceiling of Karda Nui were dislodged as the remaining Avmatoran, who had once lived in the caves above, fell into the dome with the stalactites and established villages upon the surface of Karda Nui. Even the Makuta Fortress on Destral wasn't safe, with massive damage being dealt to the Brotherhood headquarters, and some Makuta, specifically Makuta Icarix, began to question Teradax's grand plan, which thus far had resulted in chaos across the universe. In the aftermath of the Great Cataclysm, the Great Spirit Robot's camouflage system was accidentally triggered, forming a dense jungle island on the face of the robot, which would come to be known as the Island of Mata Nui. Pipes inside the robot's head leaked its fuel source, energized protodermis, which spurred plant growth and created the island's diverse climates. If you recall back to the prologue, energized protodermis was the substance that sparked the war between the Glatorian, causing the core war to start and the planet to be ripped apart. It had pretty amazing and magical transformative properties as well. Now, this energized protodermis leaked out across the universe, mutating many of the animals and species within. Many Rahi who had been roaming free around Metru Nui also escaped to this island refuge in the chaos. And finally, in a last ditch attempt to save the system, the Toa Mata, protectors of Mata Nui, were launched from the heart of Karda Nui in their canisters, ready to awaken from their slumber and spring to action to restart the core of the robot and perform their duty as a failsafe against a cataclysmic event such as this. Tragically, they were launched too late, and the damage done to their canisters from the fall caused them to malfunction sealing the Toa Mata inside the dormant canisters and plunging them to the ocean of Aqua Magna around Mata Nui, where they would lay in slumber for another thousand years, slowly losing all their memories and forgetting their training. But most grievous of all, the tremors reduced much of Metru Nui to ruin. The archives were destroyed and the Rahi within escaped. The great hub of Li Metru, its vast cables and chutes, fell to the destructive forces and became a mechanized jungle of chaos. Ga Metru's schools were ravaged by the quake as well, and the experiment labs were released to wander in the night. The Temple of the Great Spirit, the most sacred structure of Metru Nui, was nearly completely destroyed. Much of Ta Metru was overcome with molten protodermis, and the Ko Metru knowledge towers fell to ruin. As Teradax consumed the power of the city, the Toa Metru sought refuge and retreated to seek out a safe haven, with the remaining Vaki and Dark Hunter pairs still in pursuit. In his greed, Makuta Teradax activated a shadowy absorption power, sucking in both Rahi and Dark Hunters and absorbing their essences. And so, the former Toa Nidiki met his fate besides Kreka, combined and overridden with Teradax's will, guilt in his heart. As the Toa fled the city, Vakama came to a revelation. Combining the six great discs, he was able to forge the legendary Mask of Time right when he received yet another vision showing him the way to the newly created island of Mata Nui. As they rode across the Sea of Protodermis, Makuta Teradax blocked off their escape route in a new, winged form, the power of the city surging through him. To buy his team time, Vakama confronted Teradax with the newly created Mask of Time, placing the mask over his in a last-minute bid to slow time around them. Unfortunately, Vakama was overwhelmed with the power of the mask, unfamiliar with how to operate it and slowing time around both himself and Teradax. Likon appeared at that moment, blocking Teradax's shadow hand with a shield, sacrificing himself for Vakama. The resulting blast was fatal for the Turaga, and the Vahi fell from Vakama's head into the ocean. Teradax, freed from the mask power, dove from the wall after it. And so with his last breath, Likon gave Vakama his mask and uttered his final words, I am proud to have called you brother, Toa Vakama. In his grief, Vakama discovered his mask power, that of invisibility, and went once again to confront the winged dark entity. With the Vahi lost in the sea, the enraged Teradax attacked Vakama, and in a final battle against this evil force, the six Toa Metru, having finally learned unity, sealed Teradax in a temporary Toa seal to buy time for their retreat. With the battle behind them, the Toa set out for a new refuge, sailing through a new crack made in the robot's external shell. It was Matau who had flown ahead of the transport and first beheld the new land above. Nokama carved small images of the Toa Metru into stone to document their journey, as they last left the winding darkened tunnels and sailed onto a gleaming ocean, 
dazzling with an island that would come to be known as Mata Nui. Part 6. Mutation With Metru Nui destroyed and its Matoran population in slumber, the Toa Metru were defeated, only able to celebrate a small, temporary victory over Teradax. Their most monumental task still lay ahead, to return to the broken Metru Nui and recover the Matoran population, preparing them for a new life on the island of Mata Nui. On their return to Metru Nui, the Toa yet again faced many trials, combating the much more intelligent prototype to the Morbizok plant that Teradax had discarded, and learning much more about the mysterious powers of Energized Protodermis. Yeah, again, I'm really skimming through these adventures here. The Toa actually had quite a lot of adventures before returning to Metru Nui. I'm just jumping to the most important ones, but definitely, if you want the full experience, be sure to go down to the links in the description below where I've linked some of the major compilations of the Bionicle storyline. I think the one that I'm describing right now was actually the plot to one of the Game Boy games, where the Toa faced off against the prototype plant for the Morbuzak, which was actually named Karzani, and there was a lot of really interesting character stuff that went into that, even faced some sort of a Rahi Nui that would become relevant later on in the story. But it's just so much to talk about right now, we gotta move past the most important events. So again, check those out if you are interested in these characters and learning more about their personalities. As the Toa Metru made their way back to Metru Nui, battling newly mutated monsters and creatures as they went, a darkness descended on the formerly great city. Summoned by Teradax to free him from his seal and conquer the city, the Vizorak hordes descended on Metru Nui, led by the devious Rudaka and Sidorak, the so-called king of the Vizorak. As a quick recap from last chapter, Rudaka was the devious woman who transformed the Toahaga into Rahaga and in turn gained the favor of Makuta Teradax and now serves as basically his right-hand woman. As they advanced towards Metru Nui, the Toa saw a large number of Rakshi, Rahi, and webs covering the dark and crumbling city. The city's archives had been broken and the Rahi were roaming free around Metru Nui, left to their own devices. Traveling along the ocean, the ship was struck by a fierce storm that capsized the crew. The Toa were washed ashore, and their transport was utterly destroyed in the process. Still prowling the city but cut loose from their original programming, the Vaki remained an ever-present threat, but the real danger was up ahead. As Vakama brazenly led his team into the heart of the city, they were ambushed by the Vizrak spiders using their paralyzing weapons. Hung high above the Great Colosseum and cocooned by the Vizorak, the Toa Metru were bit by the vicious Rahi, injected with Vizorak venom and mutated into half-Toa, half-Rahi freaks called Hordika. No longer Toa Metru, these were the Toa Hordika, nightmarish versions of themselves who struggled to retain a grip on their sanity. As the Toa Hordika were released to plummet to their deaths by Rudaka, they were saved at the last moment by the former Toa Haga, using their nimble Rahaga forms to navigate through the sky and seize the Toa as they fell. They took them into the ruins of Ga Metru, where the Rahaga told the Toa that the Hordika venom they had been injected with needed to be neutralized, or else the venom would make their mutations permanent. Their only hope was a fable, highly intelligent Rahi spoken of in myths and legends called Kitangu, a powerful Rahi gifted in the knowledge of venoms and their counteragents, and possibly possessed the power to heal the Toa. Just a quick recap before we move on to the next section. In part two, I described the powerful Kanohi Avoki, the Mask of Light, which the Rahaga stole from the Brotherhood Fortress on Destral and fled before being transformed into Rahaga themselves. They actually stole this alongside the Makoki Stones, which was a tablet detailing the powers and abilities and weaknesses of the entire Brotherhood of Makuta, which had then been split into six parts in a bidding war led on by the Dark Hunters. Basically all you need to know is that the Tohordika go on a grand quest to find all six pieces of the Makoki Stone to unlock the Kanohi Evoki, which the Rahaga had hidden away in order to prevent from falling in the wrong hands. For all intents and purposes, this is basically a team building exercise which has no major ramifications on the story, and essentially is just a tale told to show the Tohordika getting accustomed to their new bestial forms, and even learning how to fight as part animals. Not really too relevant to the story, but it is there if you do want to check it out. Biomedia Project does have this entire story which was told through web animations at the time, 
Honestly, these web animations aren't really too riveting, so we're going to skim past them both story-wise, although if you really want to dive into it, they are there, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it over some of the other more gripping Bionicle material. Part 7. Betrayal over the course of their adventures as Toa Hordika, these newly mutated heroes had to become accustomed to their new forms, perfecting the power of their Rotuka spinner weapons and focusing on suppressing their animal instincts. However, while some of them, like Nokama and Nuju, excelled at using their new forms for good, Vakama, whose mental and emotional state was deteriorating rapidly, frequently left the group for long walks, consumed by his guilt over failing to save the Matoran and his team. Egged on by snideful remarks by Matau, who blamed him for their transformation, Vakama was plummeting into despair. On one of these walks, he was ambushed by the Vizorak, who paralyzed him and brought him before Rudaka. Taking advantage of his emotionally vulnerable state, Rudaka convinced Vakama that his friends no longer cared for him, playing to his insecurities and promising him the loyalty and power of the Vizorak Horde should he choose to lead by her side. Little did Vakama know, but this was all a ploy to usurp Sidorak, the king of the Vizrak Horde, give the Horde to Vakama, and then free Teradax with the elemental powers of Vakama's team members. But so, with his mind muddled with Hordika Venom, a confused and angry Vakama succumbed to Rudaka, pledging his loyalty to the Horde and allowing his Venom to take over his mind. Under the leadership of Rudaka, Vakama's first mission was to ambush his former friends and capture the Rahaga, which he successfully accomplished under the cover of night. Leaving only Norik barely alive to tell the tale, Vakama returned to the Colosseum with the captured Rahaga, now the leader of the Horde. However, just before they were captured, the Rahaga managed to parse the location of Kitangu from inscriptions within the Great Temple, conveying to the Toa Hordika where to find the mysterious Rahi. Underneath an icy underground mountain beneath Metrunui, Kitangu revealed himself, agreeing to help them if only they could prove themselves using their Hordika forms. And so the Battle of Metrunui commenced. Breaking through the Colosseum's defenses, the five remaining Toa Hordika converged on the Horde, with Matau grabbing Vakama and dueling him one on one. Meanwhile, the behemoth Kitangu smashed through the throne room, confronting Sidorak and Rudaka. The devious Rudaka slipped away, revealing her betrayal to Sidorak, but only a moment before Kitangu smashed Sidorak to the ground, damaging his body beyond repair and utterly killing him. Meanwhile, Matau and Vakama battled alone, with Matau apologizing for his harsh words and asking Vakama to rejoin the team. In a moment of hesitation, Matau seemingly plummeted to his death, but coming to his senses, Vakama saved his teammate, redeeming himself and rescuing Matau seconds before his demise. As the rest of the Toa Hordika freed the Rahaga and joined the fight, Vakama used his newfound command over the Vizorak Horde to disperse their ranks, leaving only a cornered Rudaka. Preparing to end the fight, the six Toa blasted her with their elemental powers. But, to their dismay, this was exactly what Rudaka wanted. As the Toa funneled their elemental power to defeat her, a piece of the seal they had used to bind Teradax broke off from Rudaka, causing a ripple effect to eventually free Teradax himself. Teradax's shadow projection enveloped her body, whisking her away for further misdeeds. And yet, Despite Teradax being unleashed and Rudaka escaping, the Toa Hordika had proved they had overcome their differences and worked as a team, gaining the favor of Kitangu, who reverted them back to their original Metru forms with his special anti venom And so, with the Vizorak threat demolished and the Matoran capsules free for rescue, the Toa began the long and arduous process of transporting the Matoran to their new home. Part 8. Fate of the Vahi as the Toa made their way back to Mata Nui on airships carrying the slumbering Matoran, Vakama held back, one final mission forefront in his mind, to search for and retrieve the missing Kanohi Vahi, Mask of Time, which was lost during their battle with Teradax many moons ago. Meanwhile, the Shadowed One, leader of the Dark Hunters, was furious with the loss of two of his most valuable assets, Nidiki and Kreka, who he assumed had been killed by the Toa Metru. And so, with the Vizorak hordes gone, the Shadowed One made preparations to return to Metru Nui in person to get revenge for the loss of his two agents. Accompanied by his bodyguard Sentrak and a time-sensitive Dark Hunter named Voparak, whose sole purpose was to track the Vahi, he left under the cover of night and sailed for what remained of Metru Nui. Just a quick fun note about Voparak, he was created by the Shadowed One in order to detect the Mask of Time. It was literally his only purpose. 
the Shadow One made him from an experiment to be time sensitive and detect the Kanohi Vahi or Mask of Time wherever it may appear. Unfortunately, this came with a very dangerous side effect. Volprak's skin emitted temporal radiation, which means that if you touched him, even just for a few seconds, you would be aged thousands of years, making him literally have a living death touch and essentially becoming a living weapon. As such, he was one of the most feared Dark Hunters, although he was rarely let out on mission other than to track down the Kanohi Vahi. And you sure bet that this power is definitely going to backfire at some point. Just wait and see. After searching through the rubble and waves, Vakama finally recovered the Kanohi Vahi, which had been damaged in the battle and leaking time energy in every direction, affecting the wildlife and plants around it. After repairing it with his mass-making abilities, Vakama was struck by a mysterious attacker who claimed the Vahi and left him unconscious. Awakening in a dreamlike state, Vakama found he was no longer a Toa. In fact, his body had reverted to a powerless Matoran. After spending what felt like a few days in this strange mirror world, Vakama slowly started to discover that all was not as it seemed, and he was actually placed under a deep illusion by Makuta Teradax, who had found him unconscious on the beach and wished to confuse him and keep him in a trance-like state. Right as he was about to break free of the illusion, a strange organic creature affixed itself to Vakama's face, giving him a vision of the future. In his mind, Vakama encountered a noble Toa of Sonics named Krakua, the last bastion against unknown evil forces defending a lone tower. In his vision, Krakua approached him, warning him of threats to come and explaining the coming of a new Toa team known as the Toa Inika, who would make a perilous quest into the darkest place imaginable. Krakua relayed to Vakama crucial information. Without these Toa Inika, Krakua would never become a Toa and his defense against the dark forces would not ever become to pass. Just a quick note here, the organic creature that affixed itself to Vakama's face is a very special time-sensitive Rahi when placed on your face. It can give you flash-forwards to the future and even open a path of communication between yourself and someone in the possible future. As to who placed it there and why it attacked Vakama specifically, all of those answers are coming later and honestly they're not too relevant right now. This exists in this particular story for two main reasons. Number one is so Vakama can have some sort of a understanding of what's to come so he could help advise the next teams of Toa, specifically the Toa Inika, which were just mentioned. And number two, I mean, it's classic sequel bait, giving a character a flash forward of something darker yet ahead and showing some sort of Toa team or heroes that would face that darkness sometime in the future, literally just teasing what's to come. This specific vision would not really come to pass until several chapters later in chronological order. We'd actually see this at around chapter five or six, if my calculations are correct. So just stay tuned until then and I will be referencing it. As to what exactly this creature is and who placed it there, the explanation is also coming, but one thing the Bionicle writing team liked to do was seed things really early in advance and then pay them off years later. This payoff would happen literally years later, so just sit tight for now, understand that there's some sort of special time-sensitive organic Rahi that can give people visions and connections to the future, and if you can accept that, then you're all good. Before he got a chance to finish, however, the creature was ripped from Vakama's face, and he found himself face to face with Makuta Teradax once again, who after a short altercation informed him that the Vahi was in the possession of the dark hunter Voparak, who had knocked Vakama unconscious when Teradax stumbled upon his body. This forced the Toa of Fire and the Master of Shadows to work together to retrieve the Vahi. As Vakama and Teradax made their way to the Dark Hunter's camp inside the Great Temple, Kitangu emerged from the shadows to challenge Teradax to combat, sensing his dark presence. Leaving Vakama to infiltrate the lair of the Dark Hunters and combat the Shadowed One's bodyguard, Sentrak, alone. As the two battles raged inside and out of the temple, Kitangu began to buckle under Teradax's blows, while Vakama succumbed to Sentrak. Just as Teradax was about to deliver the killing blow to Kitangu, a powerful blast rocked the temple, sending all four combatants flying at the feet of the Shadowed One. Quickly chaining Kitangu and holding Vakama and Teradax at bay, the Shadowed One challenged Vakama, saying he would pay for destroying two of his most trusted operatives. It was then that Vakama urged the Shadowed One to take a closer look at Teradax, revealing that in fact, Teradax had been the one to kill Nadiki and Kreka, not the Toa Metru. After seeing elements of both fallen hunters in Teradax's armor, the pair of powerful villains began to battle. 
The Shadowed One's disintegrating eye beams destroyed much of Pterodax's chest plate and both of his wings. Fakama saw his moment and took the Mask of Time from the Shadowed One by surprise, swooping down from the air using his jetpack launcher. Blasting a laser from his eye beams, the Shadowed One shot Fakama, sending him falling to his apparent death. The Shadowed One wanted to head after the fallen Toa, but Pterodax threw him at the fallen Volprak in his surprise, causing the Shadowed One to age several thousand years just in contact with Volprak's skin. Barely escaping with his life, the Shadowed One vowed war on the Brotherhood of Makuta and Pterodax himself, kickstarting a major conflict between the two evil organizations that would have major future ramifications in the universe. Fakama barely had a moment to flee the scene of the battle when Pterodax caught up to him, cornering him in an old reclamation chamber. With no other options, Fakama threatened to destroy the Mask of Time, which would cause all reality to become undone in a cataclysmic blast. And so, Fakama struck a deal with Pterodax, proposing that he allow Fakama to depart with the Mask and leave the Matoran, Kitangu, Turagaduma, and the Rahaga in peace for one whole year. Naturally, Pterodax was outraged, but with no other options and weakened from his battle with the Shadowed One, he agreed to the terms, vowing he would descend upon their island home one year from that day to threaten the Matoran with darkness once again. As Vakama warily retreated to Mata Nui, Pterodax came upon an abandoned Matoran sphere, which contained the shifty Pomatoran Akmau, who had betrayed the Toa Metru for money long ago. Awakening him from his slumber and feeding his mind with lies and twisted tales, Pterodax gained himself one new, faithful servant, Akmau, who would go on to infiltrate the island of Mata Nui and prove to be a troublesome thorn in their side for all of civilization. Eventually, all of the Toa Metru reached the new island of Mata Nui, safe from Pterodax's wrath for one year. The Rahaga, Kitangu, and Turagaduma agreed to stay behind in Metru Nui, preparing it for their eventual return and rebuilding the city brick by brick. However, the Toa Metru had one final problem. The Matoran were still comatose in the pods. And so, Vakama sacrificed his Toa power to awaken some of the Matoran, becoming a Turaga in the process. The other Toa followed suit until all of the Matoran were awakened. The effects of the spheres caused the newly awakened Matoran to lose all their memories of Metru Nui, including those of the Toa Metru and Pterodax. The newly transformed Turaga would tell them a false story concerning why they were on the island of Mata Nui, in order to protect them from the Makuta who would arrive there a year later. To honor their time as Hordika and respect the power of nature, Turaga Nuju chose to never speak Matoran again, communing only in the language of the Rahi and using the efforts of a translator named Matoro to communicate with the rest. Waiting for the prophesied Toa Mata to come, the Turaga and the Matoran began to live in the era known as the Dark Times. But that's a tale for next chapter, and with that, we've concluded Chapter 3, Legends of Metra Nui. Tune in after two weeks' time for Chapter 4, Infection where our focus shifts to the island of Mata Nui, the once proud Toa Metru turned Turaga struggling to keep order on this new island, and the birth of a brand new team of Toa hurtling down from the stars. This was Bionicle Retold. All right, that about sums up our coverage of the years 04 and 05 for Bionicle, AKA Chapter 3, Legends of Metru Nui. As usual, let me know down in the comments if anything was confusing at all to you. For this one in particular, I did feel a little bit guilty because I've been trying to get these in at around 20 to 30 minutes. And as such, I did have to cut a lot of the content, particularly pertaining to some of the characteristics and personalities of the main Toa heroes. Obviously, since I'm going through this on a very high level summary format, you are going to be missing out on some of the really fun character interactions and personality quirks and different personality traits that each of the main heroes had, specifically the Toa Metru. Every single one more or less had a pretty defined personality and they were the main characters for two years worth of a LEGO theme, so they were very fully fleshed out characters. It's just kind of unfortunate because since this is a high level summary, I've just blown past a lot of the characterization for these people just in order to tell you exactly what's going on in the main story. 
So definitely, if you're interested, I do urge you to check out the actual story content for at least the year of 2004. 2004 had a lot of really great world building and content done for it in the form of the chapter books. And 2005 was a little bit of a last minute addition. That was the whole Hordika storyline with the Venom of the Visorak. I'm going to be completely honest, it's not one of my favorite years of Bionicle. Even the writer of Bionicle has expressed his disapproval of some of the story choices made there, namely Vakama's betrayal. He felt like if any of the Toa were to betray the team, it should have been Matau, but definitely had some disagreements with the rest of the LEGO story team there. 05 didn't have too much great content, except for one really good chapter book, which I summarized in about three minutes at the end of this part. I think it was specifically part seven, which was the final part of it about the Mask of Time. So definitely if you are interested in learning more or seeing that story fleshed out a lot more, the book is called Time Trap, which featured Vakama teaming up with Makuta Teradax to reclaim the Mask of Time, which is always a really fun thing to see heroes team up with villains. But with that, I think I've summed up everything you got to know about Chapter 3, Legends of Metro Nui. Again, stay tuned in two weeks where I'll be posting the next episode in this series, which is going to be Chapter 4, Infection, where we'll actually start off with 2001, the very first year, chronologically, of LEGO Bionicle. Look forward to that. Again, let me know down in the comments what you think of this year, and thank you all for tuning in. Subscribe to Duck Breaks for even more LEGO news, reviews, discussion, and analyses coming your way very soon. Thank you so much and bye bye for now.